Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and I hope you had a good weekend and we are commencing six shows about the Eastern Front. Now some of these shows are going very far east, some are going not quite as far east. Uh, today we're not going as far east as we will be later in the week, we're talking mostly about uh, Hungary and as if you are a new viewer or you've just discovered the channel, please don't forget to click subscribe, don't forget to like the videos you're watching, comment on them during the show and leave us something nice after the show or even something negative. A comment always helps because it helps with the YouTube algorithm. So it's been a while since my guest today was on previously. Douglas Nash was on all about a year ago and it's finally come round to getting him back again and we are talking about the German attempts to relieve Budapest. So Douglas Nash is a former American Army officer, graduate of West Point, and he's turned his attention in recent years to writing about these particular sets of battles and particularly the German side of things. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Douglas in. So good afternoon, Doug. How are you today? Yeah, good. Not good. Good afternoon. How are you? Very well. So, you know, it, when we're talking about the Eastern Front, you know, it, it, it's the same old battles that get talked about a lot, Stalingrad, Moscow and things like that. But the, the Budapest area, the fighting around Poland you talked about last time is is kind of less discussed by by kind of the broad historians. But in terms of of, of what you write, you, there's quite a lot of really hardcore followers for this part, part of the history. You were saying earlier to me, lots of people in Sweden are interested in this particular battle. So um, why, why, what, what is it that intrigues you about this particular set of en uh, engagements? Well, what we're going to talk about today uh, is an operation that was in many ways had a, there's a lot of similarities between it and the Ardennes offensive or the Battle of the Bulge. Um, you know, they both of these operations took place roughly about the same time within a, several weeks of one another. And uh, just like in the Ardennes, uh, this was an offensive that was led by SS armored troops. Um, they had the element of surprise at the tactical and operational level. It took place in the dead of winter. Uh, it was an attack through the least expected avenue of approach through forest and woods and mountains along unpaved roads. Um, the attacking force followed a strict timeline, just like they did in the Ardennes, three days to reach Budapest. And um, just like we saw how the operation in the Ardennes developed, uh, the German advance was slowed by, you know, small units deciding to take a stand in small villages or crossroads or in patches of woods that began to eat into the German timeline. And um, another thing that was characteristic of both battles is that there's a very quick reaction by by the defenders. We saw how the Americans were able to move a number of divisions uh, from everywhere along their, the front in order to put them into the Ardennes and to stop the German offensive. And we see something very similar being done by uh, the Soviet command, in particular uh, the uh, Fourth Guards Army was able to react very quickly and to respond with a significant amount of force after the initial uh, troops holding the line in the woods were overwhelmed by the, the initial uh, attack. Well, we like it when shows connect and have uh, with other shows we've done. So, you know, the people I'm sure who are watching who know a lot about this engagement, and there are others who it's completely new to. But the fact, as you said, it's happening concurrently or nearly at the concurrently with the Battle of the Bulge is interesting. And of course, we'll get into the presentation later on. But the Red Army, compared to perhaps the US Army, at least has more experience of being on a defensive footing. Because let's be honest, the American Army in the ETO. It's mostly an advancing army. OK, the Mediterranean, it was a bit iffy at times. But as far as boots on the ground in, in the ETO, it was advanced all the way until the Ardennes. But the Red Army yeah. have, have had experience of both over the course of the previous four years, five years. So anyway, without further ado, we'll bring up the PowerPoint. And folks, if you have specific questions about the slide that's on screen or the map that's on screen, we'll handle them as we go along. And any kind of broader questions about, um, about this campaign as a larger subject we'll do at the end and folks we will try and avoid any kind of comparisons to the modern day affairs not that we're not interested in what's happening in ukraine it's just that we feel it's going down a rabbit hole that is that is something that we just don't want to do today uh it's it's there are there are parallels we're not going to discuss them so i'll, I'll power up the powerpoint and um, send you whoops that's not the right one i meant to do i want to do that one there we go the map and i'm going to hand over to doug and we will kind of push forward with this. So we're starting off with a reminder, folks, of what the situation was on the Eastern Front. So as, as Douglas has just reminded us, uh, 25th of December, this is within the first week of the Ardennes offensive. So we know what was happening to the West. Doug is now going to take us what, through what was happening in the East. Okay. 
Uh, the, um, the collapse of Army Group Center in June and July 1944 sort of changed the entire dynamic on the Eastern Front. And this offensive, a series of offensive rippled across the, the Eastern Front from north to south. And um, Hungary had, up until this point, Hungary had been removed from, from most of the, the fighting. They had troops on the Eastern Front, of course, but Hungary had been unspoiled. However, with the uh, collapse of the German army group North Ukraine in August and September 1944, the Red Army, in particular the Third Ukrainian Front, was able to push through Bulgaria and Romania, and during the process of which, uh, you know, captured the Ploesti oil fields from the Germans, and uh, they kept pushing. And um, the goal at that time wasn't so much seize Hungary for the sake of seizing Hungary. It was uh, the intent was to use that avenue of approach to protect the left flank of the Red Army's main effort, which of course would be the upcoming drive on Berlin and to end the war. So uh, by October of 1944, uh, what had been a sideshow on the Eastern Front became very much a focus of a lot of the, uh, the fighting that was, that was taking place at that time. The rest of the Eastern Front by October had begun to slow down, but the situation in Hungary had become very dynamic. And as a result of the Soviet push, uh, the Germans responded with a large number of tank divisions and there was a, some very large scale armored battles taking place east of Budapest throughout October and, and into the early part of uh, November of 1944. And um, at this particular point, uh, Hitler had a couple, you know, he was juggling a couple balls. He had the Ardennes offensive, which he would not shut down, even though by this point, by the middle of, by the end of December, it was beginning to show not the results he anticipated, but he wanted to keep that going. But at the same time, he saw the approach against Budapest and feared that the, the Hungarian oil fields at uh, Nazikanitsa, which was the last uh, oil fields of any significance still available to the Third Reich, um, he knew these had to be held because if they were lost, the war was lost. So even though Hun um, Heinz Guderian did not want to waste forces in Hungary, um, he wanted to have them all used for the defense of Berlin. Hitler overruled him and said, no, we're going to have to hold um, Hungary and Budapest at all at all cost, and the um, you know the reason why he wanted to keep Budapest in in the game is because Hungary by this point was the last significant German ally, and even though its army had taken some brutal hits during the fall, um, you know they still had an army an army of nearly four hundred thousand men, so it was quite an important asset uh, for the German armed forces in, in that part of the world. Uh, additionally, besides the oil, Hungary also provided a lot of uh, raw materials like steel, uh, food, and nickel, and coal, and a number of other uh, natural resources that, that Hitler thought was essential. So Hitler overruled his generals, and um, by 25 uh, December, the Red Army had encircled Budapest, and that's where we begin the story about the, uh, about the relief effort of, of Budapest called Operation Conrad. Good. Um, there, there is a photo of Budapest there I put up there. So um, uh, good stuff so far. So um, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. No questions so far. That's good. All right. And uh, so this photo here, pre-war uh, illustration of Budapest. Uh, it wouldn't stay that way very long once this uh, thing got going. Next slide. Uh, and I just want to add that was designed and built by a British company that was wow. that bridge there. I just throw that one there being being the resident like me. But yeah, we'll move on. <laughs> All right, um, for those of you who might uh, not know, in October, Germany staged a coup in Hungary. Uh, Admiral Horthy, who was the regent of Hungary at the time, he was in secret negotiations with the Soviet Union to uh, drop out of the war on the German side, become allied with the USSR. When the German Germans got wind of this plot. Um, they staged the coup in, in Budapest. You can see one of the Tiger tanks that was part of the force that was engaged in this operation which was called Operation Panzerfaust. And uh, they installed their own puppet government the, led by the Arrow Cross uh, movement. And uh, that secured Hungary's, uh, the loyalty of Hungary's armed forces at any rate uh, until pretty much the end of the war. Next. All right, and now this, this is where we get to uh, where the situation was when the 4th SS Panzer Corps began arriving. Now, up until this point, the 4th SS Panzer Corps had been 
uh, outside of uh, Warsaw, north of Warsaw, as a matter of fact, holding a what had become a, a backwater. And uh, the Totenkopf Division, which was part of the Corps, was in reserve. And the Viking Division was tied up in static uh, trench warfare and what was called the Wet Triangle. So they were there. Um, and as, as we'll see, when, when they were transferred out, uh, when the Soviet winter offensive began on 12, uh, 12 January 45, there was really nothing there to stop, stop them because the uh, 4th SS Panzergore had been moved. But um, this shows, this is a, gives you a good idea of the troop dispositions at the time uh, that the uh, Viking Division and the Totenkot Division began arriving. They were alerted on um, New Year's Eve to begin moving into Hungary. Uh, and so they had all made all their plans for to celebrate Christmas. They had food laid on and everything. So this was the last thing they expected. So on the evening um, before Christmas, instead of Santa Claus, what they got was a call from the Fuhrer headquarters telling them to uh, load up beginning the next following day on rail cars and begin a 400 kilometer trip from from the outskirts of Warsaw to unload at rail rail yards at uh, Gore and uh, Komarom in, in Hungary. So it was quite a surprise for them. But the, the Soviets did not pick up their movement into Hungary. They thought they were going someplace else. Uh, they had no idea they were going to Hungary. So uh, the Germans were able to maintain a, a large, certain amount of secrecy and were able to move a corps of 40,000 men undetected down to um, you know, the seat of war, so to speak, in Hungary. And Doug, is it because the, the Soviets don't really have the ability to work out or in intel, or is this because... The momentum is going their way. So by this point of the war, they're not really thinking about it because they think they're controlling things enough to not worry about the German response. Uh, well, they they honestly believe that the German uh, main, the focus of their defensive effort would be outside of Berlin. So when they detected um, uh, through actually Ultra first de detected the, the absence or the movement or the departure of uh, the 4th SS Corps, um, but even Ultra couldn't tell where they were going. Um, so it's not just, you know, the, the Soviet Union. It was also the Western allies by Ultra who uh, sort of missed it, just like we saw what happened in the Ardennes. They, they missed okay. that concentration as well. OK, so. So anyway, so so here we are. We have the, the Russians have crossed. I'm sorry, the Soviet Union the Red Army had crossed the. Uh, the Danube River, they're on the West Bank now, and they were driving uh, to encircle Budapest with two fronts, which is an army group. The, the third Ukrainian front, which was the main force actually uh, west of the Danube, and the uh, second Ukrainian front, which was mostly north of the Danube, but it was a force that began investing the city of uh, Budapest. So the second Ukrainian front would had actually done the inner encirclement ring and they began to build an outer encirclement ring as well just in case the uh, german garrison uh, would try to break out next okay. and, and again uh, inside budapest were uh, uh, two uh, a german corps uh, based on the uh, ninth ss mountain corps with two ss cavalry divisions the 60th panzer grenadier division failed here in Halle, and the 13th panzer division and there was a um, a Hungarian corps was also trapped inside, um, along with the two Hungarian divisions. So you had any, depending on who you listen to, between seventy to eighty thousand uh, German and Hungarian troops within the city. Now, uh, on one December, Hitler had already declared Budapest a fortress, a festum, which meant um, they were there until either they fought to the last bullet or until they were relieved from the outside. So. Um, the hands of the commander of, of the fortress Budapest, his hands were tied from the beginning, and um, he had very little scope of action, even if you know he had any uh, original ideas of his own. Everything was, uh, at this point, was being directly, you know, day-to-day -day decisions were being made by the, uh, by the Fuhrer. And this is the commander of the uh, fortress uh, Budapest, um, uh, you know, he's an SS and police general, uh, Pfeffer Wildenbruck. Um, he kind of like uh, Paulus at Stalingrad. He was not a very dynamic personality. He was quiet, uh, soft-spoken, not, again, not a driving personality like you would see in like a Guderian or a Patton. And uh, he was the type who would follow orders and uh, 
not exercise a lot of initiative until the very end, as, as we'll see. But uh, um, not exactly the most ideally suited individual to be commanding this this fortress. But that but that's kind of par for the course at this point. The war, isn't it? You know, the, the people yeah. left in the in in command now are the kind of the yes men and the ones that don't rock the boat post post the assassination attempt on Hitler in July. It's it's been a weeding out of anybody who's got any ideas. So this is something that's, that the, the German army is weakening itself uh, day yeah. by day, day by the same kind of purges the Soviets were doing, uh, you know, a decade and a half earlier. So it's, um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not to be surprised that there are some undynamic commanders around at this point of the war. It's the, the, the yes men, but yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll move on. So there's, there's a, a much more dramatic photo yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, the, the German, uh, you know, Pfeffer Wildenbrook, as well as the commander of the uh, sixth army, General Balk, um, uh, they both wanted to withdraw from the eastern bank of the Danube, which was the sub or the part of the city called Pest. Buda is the west bank, Pest is the east bank. And um, they thought by withdrawing troops over the uh, river in a timely fashion that would have added about 30,000 men to the, to the uh, garrison on the western bank. But Hitler, as usual, delayed his, his decision until the very last minute. So by the time troops did withdraw, uh, they had suffered a considerable number of, of casualties. So, you know, again, like many of his decisions, they were made at the last minute when it was far too late really to make a difference. And of course, the bridges were blown. Um, and uh, so the Russians, their tactical challenge was a little bit more uh, significant because now they had to do a, a, a river crossing in the face of a, um, you know, a fully alert and uh, armed enemy. And on that subject, we have our first question from a viewer from Ian Carr there. And we know by this point that the Western allies, the British and Americans, have perfected the art of river crossings with Bailey bridges and pontoon bridges. But the question is, how are the Red Army, how are the Soviet Union at crossing rivers by this stage? What technology do they have available to them? Uh, they, uh, they, were, they became very adept at, at river crossings, uh, believe it or not, that technologically wise, they didn't have all the sophisticated river crossing equipment that we had. Uh, but their technique generally would be to push an assault force over in rafts somewhere where there wasn't, you know, a strong defensive front built up and uh, seize a bridgehead. Once they seize a bridgehead with maybe a battalion or a regiment, uh, those who would cross would defend that to the death. Um, but in the meantime, while they were fighting against the German, inevitable German counterattack, uh, they'd be pushing engineers and pontoons, uh, which a lot of them were basically field expedient pontoon bridges uh, using whatever material at, at hand. They did have engineer and sapper battalions, sapper brigades, in, in fact, um, who specialize in this sort of thing. So they would very rapidly, you know, erect something that was not up to the same technological standards, but it was certainly sufficient in order to keep pushing troops and guns and tanks across that, um, across that, you know, water obstacle. And then, um, the Germans found in almost every case, it was extremely difficult to dislodge them once they established a, a, a beachhead or a bridgehead. Super. Brilliant. Thank you for answering that one. So here, another another photo. Yeah. Um, and this is General um, um, General Obers, uh, Otto Verler. He was the commander of Army Group South, which is what they renamed um, Army Group North Ukraine or South Ukraine after it was wiped out and so he was a new commander he had previously commanded the eighth army north of the danube until the uh, uh general friesner who had been the commander was relieved by hitler on, on christmas at christmas uh verler was a very conscientious man but again like pfeffer wildenbrook he was not a, a strong personality uh, he wasn't one so much to rock the boat he was very good commander very skilled uh, but again somebody who would uh, follow follow orders and not uh, kick up a fuss if you know he was told to do something he didn't agree with and this is again this is one of the biggest um, you know question marks about this battle this is um, general of the panzer troops uh balk um who was brought over from uh, the western front at christmas also to replace um general Freder pico who had been the commander of sixth army until he incurred hitler's wrath and so um, uh, General Balk uh, had a reputation at this time as the, you know, the master tactician, master of maneuver, uh, expert at tank warfare, uh, a guy who had uh, 
you know, ignore orders uh, from above to achieve a goal. And, and nine times out of 10, he was successful. Um, but because he was also perceived by Hitler and his, his inner circles being very reliable politically, um, reliable, you know, he was a member of the Nazi party. Um, they thought he was a man who was, uh, who they needed to put it, put in Hungary in order to, uh, you know, fix the log jam that, that it seemed to be um, um, inhabiting the leadership of army group South and sixth army in particular. So they thought this dynamic panzer general bringing him in at this stage of the game would be able to, uh, you know, turn things around as we'll see, it didn't quite work uh, that way. And here we have um, SS um, uh, general, uh, General Lieutenant General Leutnant or uh, Gruppenfuhrer uh, Herbert Gilly, uh, commander of the 4th SS Panzer Corps. Um, he was known throughout um, SS circles as a newer soldat, that is, and he was only a soldier. He was not a big proponent of national socialism. He was fairly apolitical in, in actuality, um, but he was one of these pure soldier types that an order was sacred. So uh, at and on the one hand, he was very concerned about the welfare of his troops, but on the other hand, he would carry out his orders to the letter if, if humanly possible. So it was kind of a, a strange mix, uh, but he had, uh, you know, he had uh, basically been the driving force of the German, you know, defensive effort within the Cherkasy pocket a year earlier. And um, you know, when he was commanding the Viking division, and he was also flown into the Koval pocket and, and March, 44, just a month after uh, after the breakout from the Cherkasy pocket. And again, he revitalized the defense. Um, he knit together all these different forces from the German army, SS, police, and railway, and formed into a coherent force that held out against the, uh, the Soviet encircling forces until a relief force was finally able to fight its way and relieve Koval at, uh, at, at the beginning of April. And that's why he was picked. He and his corps were, were handpicked by Hitler to be the force to go and relieve Budapest because the logic went, at least what Hitler said, well, he'd been in pockets twice. He'd fought his way out twice. He knew how, you know, he knew about the psyche of troops uh, who were in these situations. He knew how to lead men in, in, in such situations. So he seemed to be an ideal choice. He was a hard driving guy, not particularly brilliant. Um, but again, once he was given orders to relieve uh Koval or, or relieve Budapest in this case, he would do his utmost um, to push and, and achieve that uh, achieve that mission. In many ways, he was very much like Hermann Bock, the commander, his immediate commander in this operation. Both are very headstrong. Both were, you know, loyal to the regime. Uh, and during, we'll see during this operation, they butted heads many times. And it, a couple of times, at least, General Bock tried to get him relieved of, of command because he was doing something that Bach wouldn't agree with. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Yep. We've had a couple of people ask if G uh, Gilly was not particularly political, why did he join the SS? Is it because they just sort of had the best kit? No, uh, he joined in the early thirties. Um, he was at that time, he was considered too old for the, uh, for the rice here. Um, so he joined what seemed uh, like a, he needed a steady income. So he had been an itinerant car salesman, car parts dealer um, and he had just gotten married and he needed a solid job. So at that time in like 1934, 35, you could join um, the SS and the prospects for promotion were very good. Uh, he had fought in World War I that distinguished himself uh, as an artillery officer. And um, he, you know, he just went where uh, I guess is the easiest way to get back in the uniform during that period in the 1930s was going into what became the, the Waffen SS. Okay, super. So thanks for answering the question. We've got on to our next map. So this is now troop dispositions in advance of Conrad one, I think, isn't it? Uh, yes. Let me, I'm going to try to get back to that so I can, uh, so I can talk intelligently here. Hold on. And that's map, uh, map three, right? Okay, good. Okay. So here we are, we're looking at the situation. Um, immediately prior uh, to the launch of Operation Conrad. Uh, as a matter of fact, it began on 1 January. And you'll see, um, you know, Lake Balaton there in the lower left-hand corner as you follow the trace of the front line up, 
Uh, you'll see right on the Danube, you got the fourth SS Panzer Corps with the two SS divisions, the Viking and the Totenkopf. You had uh, Division Group Papa, which was made up of tank battalions with very little infantry because the three Panzer divisions that the tank battalions belonged to were sent north of the uh, Danube to fight against the uh, sixth tank army at the, in the middle of December in order to prevent the sixth tank army from breaking out and driving to Vienna. Um, and so Guderian ordered something very strange. He split up Panzer divisions, which is something he always advocated against. But at that particular point, that was the only thing he could do. There were no other reserves available. And uh, so he sent these three Panzer divisions north of the Danube, left their tank battalions back, and they were grouped and called Group uh, Papa, Panzer Group of Papa. And, um, and so that's kind of where they started. And the focus of the offensive is going to be in an easterly direction, straight up uh, through the Vertus and Gerexa Mountains um, in order to take a northern route uh, towards Budapest. Now, they had discussed another route that would, would have gone south through the town of Stuhl Weissenberg, which is the German name for Zikas Fervahar, which is, I don't think I pronounced that right. My Hungarian is terrible. Um, but there was like two options, go south. Um, and swing around to Budapest from the south uh, or go north through the mountains and the forest and, and go that way. Now, why, they, why the hell did they choose that option? Uh, the main reason was it was shorter, would require only half as much fuel. Um, the troops would, were, were assembling, would be assembled four days earlier than the southern option, uh, which was called option Paula, and the northern option was called Conrad. And so and there was a tug of war between Guderian, General Verler, Hitler, and the chiefs of staff of, you know, General Vink there in the OKH uh, leadership uh, department and Army Group South Chief of Staff. So they fought back and forth about which was the best way to go. And they finally settled on the northern option. And so that's why you see the uh, fourth SS Panzer Corps grouped up there in the north and you know, facing, um, you know, facing east there. And but we'll see the, the southern option will come back and play here shortly. Cool, but super. So back to some a little run of photos. So yeah, and, and again, here's a picture of General Gila uh, when he was just had taken command of the Fourth SS Panzer Corps in July of the previous year. Uh, again, um, very experienced commander, commanded the Viking Division for a year on the Eastern Front, and had been in command of the Fourth SS Panzer Corps since the end of July '44. So experience again not a brilliant guy um but at this particular state of the of the war that's not what hitler was looking for he wanted someone who could get the job done who wouldn't question orders who could be dependent upon to drive his troops hard to achieve an objective next time and talking about his troops it's a broad question but what's their morale like at this point of the war because you know the writing is kind of on the wall now for the Third Reich. Obviously, the SS is a slight, and the Waffen SS is a slight different beast because it's got its own ideology there. But you know, when he when he moves in there at this point, you know, early January, how would you rate their morale on you know one to ten? It's a weird question, but just to give us some kind yeah. of gauge. No, no, that's a good question. Um, the old core of the of the of the Viking and the Totenkopf division had been killed or wounded or maimed or or taken out of action during the three battles of, uh, of Warsaw, the three defensive battles. Both divisions took horrendous casualties. And uh, in order to bring them back up to strength, uh, they received something on the order of magnitude of 15,000 Luftwaffe personnel were transferred to the Corps, about um, 5,000 or so to each division um, to bring them back up. Uh, the Corps, uh, Corps troops, you know, the artillery, uh, you know, the signal battalion, they received a full complement of men from these Luftwaffe um, troops who were nicknamed Hermann Göring donations because they didn't voluntarily uh, leave the Luftwaffe. Her Hermann Göring just said, okay, I've got 15,000 airmen. I don't need any more because I don't have many planes left. And so he gave them in an agreement with Heinrich Himmler. Uh, so they went to these divisions uh, during the fall of 44, some during the battle of war, the actual defensive battle of Warsaw when it was still going. Um, and a lot of them were killed and wounded, but by December, uh, both divisions were not engaged in high level, you know, high, high intensity combat operations. So there was some time to incorporate these new guys, these Luftwaffe uh, soldiers. 
um, well, they're now soldiers anyway, um, you know, they would receive maybe a month or two of training and these special training regiments that were set up to accommodate them. And then once they you know, achieved a certain level of proficiency, they were then assigned to the divisions. And then they went down to the infantry companies, platoons and squads. And after a month or so of this, um, they, they, the morale of the divisions improved. Um, they had had a chance to you know, rest and, uh, you know, recuperate from the exertions of the, the summer and fall of 1944. So by the time they arrived in Hungary, they were kind of angry that they'd been cheated out of Christmas dinner. But at the same time, they under, you know, they were told by their commanders why, why are they there, what they were going to do. You're going to really Budapest. You're going to save your brethren. And you know, there was about 30,000, not quite 30,000 SS troops inside Budapest with, you know, those, those two divisions that were in there. So I think, especially the Totenkopf division had a very can-do, positive attitude, not positive in a nice sort of way, but very yeah. driven in the sense that they, uh, you know, if you wanted to elevate something like an order into, you know, a holy, you know, a holy mission, um, it, that division probably still had a, quite a bit of the old, what they call the old SS spirit. So both divisions drove themselves very hard. And you can only do that if you have men who are, motivated and well-trained and, and clued in as to what's going on. And they still had a very good NCO Corps at this time, uh, junior officers, NCOs, very experienced. A lot of them were new, but a lot of the officers had been enlisted men. Um, so even though some of them may be new to the job of platoon leader or platoon sergeant, they, they gave a pretty good showing of themselves, as we'll see in some, some pretty incredible uh, circumstances. Yeah, cool. It's a long answer to a short question. No, it was a good answer, though. We, we liked it. And here we have uh, the commander of the, the Totenkopf Division, um, uh, Helmut Becker. He had been a concentration camp officer back in the 30s under Theodore Eicke, the original division commander of the Totenkopf. But uh, even though he was prone to drink and uh, he had a lot of other uh, negative personality traits as a, as a commander, again, uh, he would follow orders. He was very, you know, energetic, and uh, he was tactically fairly, fairly good as a tactician at the division level. So, and he he was a pretty tough guy, and um, he demanded uh, nothing less of his uh, subordinates that he demanded of himself. Cool. Okay, and here in the center, wearing the earmuffs, is the commander of the Viking division at the time, Carl Ulrich. Um, he had also been a Totenkopf officer. Uh, during uh, up until the summer of 1944, and he was chosen to replace Johannes Mullenkamp as the commander of the Viking Division. He was also very good. He was an engineer by trade, um, but again, uh, like his mentor, uh, you know, Helmut Becker, uh, he was a good tactician, uh, but he was a little bit more, I don't know, he was not as, as hard on his troops. As a matter of fact, he was a little more you know, understanding. He was somebody you could talk to. He's very approachable. Um, he turned out to be a very good commander and he commanded the Viking division from about October of 44 until the end of the war. And the men, the men of the Viking who were used to having their own guys move up the chain of command to take over the division. They liked him a lot. He was very popular. Brilliant. Okay. And this is, um, uh, the fourth SS Corps had two army divisions, two Wehrmacht Heer uh, divisions that were assigned to it for this mission. Uh, the first was the 96th Infantry Division, commanded by General Major, General Mayor uh, Hermann Herrendorf, who you see here as a colonel. Um, very skilled leader, division very tried and true, uh, solid, reliable, old old type, 1944 type division, uh, not a Volksgrenadier division. It, it had a large number of veterans and uh, performed at a very high level during this uh, during this operation, which in contrast to how some of the German infantry divisions on the Western Front were, were performing, his was far and above uh, those, those divisions in terms of uh, proficiency. And his division would attack, would uh, carry out a river crossing operation at night to cover the flank of the Totenkopf division. So again, um, something you wouldn't expect uh, a nighttime river crossing operation under fire in the rear of the Soviet uh, defensive positions, but he was able to pull it off with his, with his division. And again, here's another surprise. Uh, this is the commander of the 711th Infantry Division, uh, Josef Reichert. 
Now, Reichert's division had been a, a Bodenständig division. That is, it was a, a, a not a maneuver division that had no vehicles, no tanks. Um, it was meant to fight and die in place on the Normandy coast or in the, on, on the, uh, the, the English Channel coast. And it had been mauled in Normandy, withdrew to Holland, was completely rebuilt as a type 1944 infantry division and uh, mostly recruits from the German Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine from the German Navy. Um, so no one expected much out of this division. It arrived late, not to their fault, but due to the rail traffic. And it was, um, uh, was to also help protect the flank of the, the Totenkopf division. And um, there was a supporting effort. Uh, it wasn't the 4th SS Panzer Corps alone taking on the 4th Guards Army. Uh, the 3rd Panzer Corps, uh, under Herman Breith, who you see here, very skilled and uh, uh, experienced commander, he was in charge of group of, uh, Corps Group of Breith, which included not only the 3rd Panzer Corps, but a, a Hungarian Corps and the uh, German 1st uh, Cavalry Corps um, that was sort of a hodgepodge of leftover um, you know, Hungarian units, as well as a few, a couple German Panzer Divisions, 1st Panzer Division, 23rd Panzer Division, and the 4th Cavalry Brigade, all of whom were sort of worn, had been worn down during the defensive fighting during the month of December. But again, skilled tactician, he'd been a Corps commander for a long time, um, and his job was to tie down uh, the mechanized elements of the 4th Guards Army while Gila struck the soft underbelly, so to speak. Brilliant stuff. And this is General Hartnick. He was the Hartnick. He was the commander of the 1st Cavalry Corps, subordinate to Bryce for this operation, although they were the same rank. Um, he was a cavalryman. Um, his his brigade, his two brigades that he had were horse were mounted, and um, but again, it was an elite. Um, his cavalry brigades were elite organizations that were later expanded into cavalry divisions um, a few months af after this operation. But again. He was taking part. That's uh, now this colorful looking character, uh, Rudolf Holsta, is a commander of the Fourth Cavalry Brigade, which was to play an important role in, in the fighting that was uh, about to about to begin. And last but certainly not least, uh, well, he's not the last, but uh, this is General uh, Meyer Eberhard um, Dürnert. He was the commander of the First Panzer Division, of the oldest Panzer Division in the German Army, very experienced. Um, and he was in the south. He was in charge of uh, uh, actually carrying out the deception or the the the, you know, the uh, feint towards the south. It was his troops that would uh, take on the Soviet forces um, east of uh, Lake Balaton. And again, this is the last guy. This is uh, Wilhelm. So there's two more after this one before we get to the map. There's lots oh, yeah, more. Well, there's, yeah. yeah, we'll get to the good, Yeah, this is uh, General uh, Sirth. Commander of the Third Panzer Division. He came in a little later during Conrad II, and we'll we'll talk about him in a while. But and then I think uh, next we have the, the next two are, are Soviet. So um, right, yeah, right, right. And and then uh, this is General Fyodor Tolbukhin. He was the Marshal of the Soviet Union, Commander of the Third Ukrainian Front. Um, he was in charge of the uh, armies advancing on the uh, western bank of the uh, of the Danube, and the fourth guards army came under his control and we'll see again, not a brilliant guy, good at following orders. It's very steadfast. Um, and again, he, he did what was, he did what was needed. He's not a Patton, not a bulk. Okay. But, um, slow and steady. This is general Rodian, uh, Marshal of the Soviet Union, Rodion Malinovsky, commanded the second Ukrainian front, responsible for the encircling ring and the outer, uh, ring, uh, of Budapest. Super. And are we ready for the first film now? Is that now? Yes. Yeah, that's that's a good time. So, sure. folks, the Douglas has provided us these uh, two, there's two little bits of film. They're silent, so Doug's going to talk during it. And the first one is kind of showing troops moving into position, if I'm if I'm right. So uh, we'll play that now, and Doug will add a bit of a commentary to it. So it's about three, minute, three minutes, I think. Now, this is a German uh, a Deutsche Wolkenschau uh, propaganda newsreel that was uh, filmed during December, right as right at the point uh, immediately before Budapest was encircled, and it shows the residents of the city uh, helping to, you know, prepare barricades against uh, approaching Soviet tanks. Um, Eight hundred thousand civilians were trapped in the city when it was encircled, and no preparation had been made. 
uh, for their welfare, whether feeding or water or anything. So that was to impact that battle, which is an entirely different story. I won't really get into much detail, but you see here some Hungarian forces, um, especially the Hungarian artillery was very good, and they played a key role in the defense of the city. And now what we see, the, the gathering elements of the relief force. So this is early January with snow on the ground. And uh, that was the 6th Panzer Division uh, there. And now we see some... Uh, some SS troops fighting in one of the villages. Now, a lot of this footage is out of out of order, out of sequence. Uh, they would take films from um, the German uh, war correspondents and they just kind of splice it together any old way to portray fighting going on at the front. But um, uh, these scenes we're looking at now were, were taken in the town of uh, uh, Sikas or Stuhl Weissenberg and, and show some of the tanks of the 1st Panzer Division rolling in. They fought their way into this town and during Conrad II, liberated it. And, um, you know, and this was later on in January. So again, this is out of order. Now what we see here, these are uh, a column of the Viking division marching through the, uh, uh, through the Rexa mountains and as they head towards Bishka, which is their intermediate objective. And, uh, you know, it just shows some, some combat footage, uh, you know, random combat footage taken at this time. Uh, where you see these guys, you'll see them later. Uh, they're firing at a Soviet cavalry uh, unit. And, and if you had a higher res, you could see the horses galloping away. I don't think they hit anybody. But again, these are some of the German artillery of the relief force pounding away at the Soviet positions. Uh, Conrad did not begin with an artillery barrage, unlike uh, the first SS Panzer Division attack in the northern shoulder of the Battle of the Bulge. And here we see uh, Kampfgruppe Dor, the leading element of uh, the Viking division going through the Gerexa Mountains, uh, bypassing some of the uh, knocked out uh, Soviet tanks. And again, here they are again, um, going through the mountains. You, you see you know, the terrain there, it's very wooded, very hilly, a lot of ravines. And um, as, as the fighting continued, there was a large number of uh, Soviet troops who were bypassed but the Germans didn't have enough infantry to mop them up. So that's, that's the first part there. I, I and, yeah, in terms of, um, uh, it, it, to me, I, mean, I don't know as much about the German forces. I do the Allied. They seem pretty well equipped in those photos. I know there's that element of they're filming the people with the best kit. It's propaganda. It's, it's newsreel teams. But to me, they do look pretty equipped. I mean, it, it's not like, it's not like they haven't got winter gear. They've got some decent vehicles there. So, you know, as, as far as it goes by this early part of 1945, they, it's about as, as an efficient a force as the Germans could possibly muster at this time, I guess. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And those and the two SS divisions and the 4th SS Panzer Corps, they had a month, more or less. Um, they were able to rotate men into the front line. The Totenkopf was in reserve for almost a month. So they had time to clean their kit, get their equipment squared away, repair you know, what they could. Um, and yeah, so they showed up, made a pretty good appearance uh, of themselves. The 7th and 11th Infantry came from Holland, so they were in pretty good condition as far as their material. And the 96th Division had just come from a rest area as well. So the force forces that were engaged as the main effort for Conrad I um, were probably about the best Germany could muster at that at that time, especially on the Eastern Front, because up until this point, all the best units that had been refreshed had been committed to the, um, you know, the operation in the Ardennes. And we've had a couple of people asking about the foreign contingents as part of the, 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 the Viking division, the Viking division. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that. And um, as a reinforcement to the Viking division, uh, which had suffered so many casualties during the battles of, around Warsaw, um, two newly reconstituted battalions um, from the Nordland division, the Nor Norga or the Norge, <clears throat> uh, one battalion, the first battalion of Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Nor Norga, and uh, another one from Denmark, um, a Danish, supposedly Danish battalion that had also been refreshed. Um, both of these battalions, instead of being sent to, to Courland, uh, you know, on that front up there in the, on the Baltic, um, because they were in, in within the German ter territory at the time, they were sent to the Viking division. Of course, by the time they got there, the Viking didn't need them anymore, but they weren't going back. So, so they stayed and fought as um, and two additional infantry battalions in support of the Viking division. And they did, they performed very well. And we'll talk about one particular engagement 
involved, well, two engagements involving involving the Norga uh, battalion. So yes, yeah, so you had those, and you had a um, a Hungarian regiment, a Hungarian SS regiment called SS Regiment Ne, named after uh, you know a a Hungarian you know soldier of fortune adventurer type who had been an officer in the Hungarian army called Karoli Ne, uh, who raised its force mainly composed of Hungarian veterans of the Eastern Front. And um, because he was basically not accept found not acceptable by the, the leader of the Arrow Cross movement, Salazi, uh, he was basically kicked out of the Hungarian army. And uh, the SS by that time was more than willing to have a couple battalions of motivated guys come and uh, fight with, alongside them. So they were equipped and armed by the, by the, by the Waffen SS. And they also participated in, in the fighting as additional infantry. And that was a theme that runs throughout, you know, all three of these operations is that there was never enough infantry forces uh, available to do the things they normally do in, a, in an armored attack. So, so when the armor goes through, it takes an objective and moves on to the next one. You need infantry behind them to mop up and, to, you know, take out bypass uh, enemy units and, you know, the Germans were very hard pressed to do that. And they had to keep dropping off forces as the deeper they went into into enemy held territory, the more troops had to drop off to secure their supply routes and their flanks. And that sort of thing. And there was never enough to uh, compensate for the inherent shortage of infantry in, in, in any panzer division. OK, well, I, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact where we haven't got to the actual operations yet, but there's loads of questions. coming. Just two we can do with kind of one word answers. One is. Is a lot of the German uh, um, rear supplies horse drawn? I guess the answer is going to be yes. Um, not in the uh, not in the SS divisions. The 96th division and the uh, 711th division. Yes, they were they were relying on horse drawn transport to bring up the bulk of their supplies. Their heavy artillery battalion and their anti tank companies um, were generally motorized. Okay, and the other one is about air power on either, on both or either side. Yeah, air power played a significant role during this operation, uh, surprisingly. The Luftwaffe, for a time there, for the first couple of weeks, was able to generate two to 300 sorties a day, uh, mostly ground support missions and support of the attacking columns. Of course, the Red Air Force was up there in, in strength, usually outnumbering the Luftwaffe two or three to one. Um, and they were, both sides had their fighters up in the air trying to get um, you know, control of the air. Uh, eventually, the, the you know the Red Air Force uh, won that battle simply because they were over the overwhelm the Germans, uh, you know the Luftwaffe. But up in, for the first couple of weeks, so uh, uh, the attacking force got an unaccustomed amount of uh, uh, you know, Luftwaffe close air support, and of course at the same time the Luftwaffe was flying resupply missions to Budapest, dropping you know several dozen tons of supplies each each evening as well as flying in supplies and gliders okay well we have the um operation comrade one up on the on screen right. so um all right yeah i'll, I'll try guys i know we're probably going over long so I'll, no uh, it's fine but people are loving it it's good views right. best views i've had for a couple of weeks douglas so uh, right. if you're if you're happy to keep on talking i'm happy to keep yeah, we're no, loving it no problem um okay so we're looking at the map of operation conrad one um you see the danube there that that's the the forces went in uh, straight, uh, you know, eastwards, and then the uh, the 96th Division did the crossing, got behind the Soviet defenders of uh, a guards a rifle division that was what you know defending against that that end or that part of the uh, the front, um, and of course then you had the Totenkopf, and then down in the south you had the Viking. Uh, the the 711th came in later, you know, about day eight, um, but they would the two Panzer divisions would would go eastwards and then pivot to the right or pivot south and head towards um, their intermediate objectives. The uh, Viking Division's intermediate objective was the town of Bishka, uh, which is right there where the O is on Operation Conrad on the on the legend. And uh, the Totenkopf Division's intermediate objective was Zambek. And from there it was about 16 kilometers to Budapest. So that was uh, that that was the intent. And you see, you know, with the, the light gray arrows, you see where they pushed their way into it, fighting pretty hard, especially at uh, um, Taryan and Bajna. Uh, those are two significant uh, battles fought there and some more as well that the uh, Totem Cup fought. So it wasn't easy, but, um, and they were being delayed by 
fairly skillful uh, Soviet counterattacks, armored counterattacks. These forces would sacrifice themselves to buy time so Fourth Guard's army could move more mechanized units up there. Because up until this point, all the Germans faced were three weak rifle divisions and one armored brigade with less than 50 uh, armored fighting vehicles. So it went pretty well the first couple of days, but after about the 3rd of January, things started slowing down a bit. And uh, the German advance more or less had culminated by, in the South, it had culminated by about the 5th of January, whereas, and whereas up in the North, the 7th 11th Infantry Division, which no one expected anything of, they were able to kept moving on along the banks of the Danube on the Southern Bank, and they were able to take the, um, the city of Gran or Esdergom, uh, again, forgive my terrible Hungarian, but they were able to take Gran by 8th of uh, January. No one expected this. And this will have an important implications later. But one thing I want to point out is, is uh, the Hedgy Castle estate. And you see that um, in the lower right-hand corner, a uh, little square. And um, that, that became sort of a... a a little miniature Alamo, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But that was the objective of the Vikings Panzer Regiment. And they were went in there and they seized that high ground because it's a commanding position. Anyone who held that estate had a commanding view of the countryside for miles or kilometers. And uh, it would also block that paved highway that connected Zambek to Bishka. So that was that was very critical, and they punched in there, and they soon found themselves cut off. And I'll I'll talk about that in a minute. Super. And it's interesting you said it starts running out of steam after three or four days because I spent a week in Normandy with James Holland uh, last week, and he says that his kind of rule of thumb is all operations, whichever side is doing it, seem to run out of steam after three or four days. It seems that just it, it's just a a natural way for so the, the inertia to kind of reach a peak after three or four days. So it's just yeah. interesting that this would, this would fall into that, that, that um, unofficial rule as well. Well, and there was no second echelon to the German attacking force. Unlike the, the Red Army, their doctrine dictated that they have a, a first echelon, the breakthrough, and then the second echelon, the you know, exploitation, and then the third echelon if the first two can't do it. So, but they had the men and the material to do that, whereas the Germans, it was like, one and done. Uh, but one thing I want to point out on this map is that um, the pressure being put on Fourth Guard's army was tremendous. Um, they'd been caught flat-footed initially, but after the second day, figured out what was going on and began to push uh, forces in up north to stop Gila's uh, advance. But as a supporting effort north of the Danube, General Malinovsky was ordered to launch a diversionary attack across the Garam um, River uh, headed, headed west, and that's what you see north of the river. You see the uh, 5th Guards Tank Corps, the 9th Guards Mechanized Corps, and an infantry corps from the 6th Guards Tank Army. They punched their way through a very thin German defensive line held by two very weak divisions, and they were going hell for leather towards uh, Comoran or um, even beyond that, uh, you know, towards the gateway towards Vienna. The ground here is very flat, very suitable for armor. So, you had this strange situation that you rarely see in wartime. They have two opposing armies. Both of them are attacking parallel to one another in opposite directions. So uh, the idea was to force the Germans to break off their attack because of this threat emanating from the north of the, of the Danube. But um, the Germans, by clever you know, repositioning of the 8th Panzer Division and the 20th Panzer Division that was brought in, they were able to slow this attack and stop it and push it all the way back to the Grand River again. So it wasn't quite successful. And the Germans, to General Balk's credit, he didn't take the bait. He kept focusing on the main effort, which was, you know, south of the uh, south of the Danube. Super. And now we have a little a run of photos again now. And again, yeah. thank you so much for this incredible batch of um, images. It's, I do some shows where there's there's almost no surviving imagery, but today it's it's thank courtesy to you. We've got some amazing shots. Yeah. Um, and, and again, this is a Panther from a totem cop division um, on the road there that uh, there was a river road along the southern bank of the Danube. 
and that was the Totenkopf Division's main avenue of approach. When the 96th Division crossed the river, got behind the, the Red Army troops defending that part, they had no chance of success, and all they, the best they could hope for was delaying action. But the uh, tank spearhead of the Totenkopf Division was very strong. That division had um, over 100 armored fighting vehicles operational, and they were able to blow through the, uh, the Soviet uh, defenders. Um, but the regimental commander, their tank regiment, was killed in action. That was uh, Pichelis, uh died uh, leading the uh, leading the assault, which was unfortunate. Um, but anyway, uh, that's one of their one of their Panthers. Next, and that's that's Pichelis there. Um, you know, before uh, obviously before he was killed. Yep. Yep. Next. Oh, and that's uh, that's the uh, commander of the the. Panzer Grenadier Regiment Five of the Totenkopf, uh, Fritz Eckert, pre-war shot there. Next one, and uh, Franz Kleffner, he commanded uh, Panzer Grenadier Regiment Six, Theodore Eicha. So he had some very experienced guys, um, highly decorated, all of them, um, operating at their peak level of proficiency. Next, and again, this is a shot you saw on the on the film. Shows the uh, S, you know shoots in Panzerwagen, the armored personnel carriers of Kampfgruppe Dor. Uh, leading a column of Panthers through the hills. And you see in this photo gives you a good idea of just the terrain itself was very similar to what you, you saw in the Ardennes. Um, but in this particular case, you had, you know, bypass Soviet soldiers on the left and right in the woods firing at you. And you had to stop, clear them out, leave some guys behind them, keep it open and then keep pushing. And again, they had that strict timeline, three days to get to Budapest. Um, you know, they it was... You know, each time they had one of these little engagements, it slowed them out. But to their credit, they kept pushing. Next. And again, you saw this in the video, uh, passing a burning of truck carrying fuel. Uh, I don't know if it was a German or, or Soviet truck, but uh, they, you know, they, if you look at the film, you know, they drive right past this thing. And, uh, and you see the guys duck inside the, uh, the half track because it's so damn hot. And that's Hans Dorr himself, a uh, commander of... Uh, um, Panzer Grenadier Regiment 9, Germania. Uh, he was like the Iron Man of, uh, of often SS. Um, highly decorated, been wounded 15 times up to this point. Very reliable, very, very proficient, uh, very respected by the men. Not exactly loved, but definitely respected because he was another one of these guys who got things done. Next. And this is a photo shows the river crossing of the Danube by the uh, 7-11th, I'm sorry, the 96th Infantry Division, which took place at night. These are, you know, follow-on forces that are crossing during the daytime to augment the uh, augment the division. Um, only about half of the division had showed up by 1 January when the attack began, so they had to keep feeding guys in just because the rails, the rail system wasn't moving as efficiently as efficiently as it used to. Next, again, here's a column of. Um, of half tracks from the uh, Viking division, again, part of uh, Kampfgruppe Dor, uh, approaching the, uh, the town of Tarjan or Tar Tarjan. And you see, this is, you know, they had one, one um, armored infantry battalion within that division, within the Viking division. So they teamed these, that battalion up with the uh, combined tank regiment and that formed Kampfgruppe Dor. So they had basically all the armored fighting vehicles and the half tracks of the Viking uh, that were combined into one task force. And they were the, um, but behind them, there wasn't, you know, the Westland Regiment, the other regiment, it took, they didn't get there for a couple more days. So they were on their own for the first uh, three or four days of the fighting. And, and, you know, you made the observation that there is a connection, a comparison with the Ardennes, but, and it is similar terrain, but we know when we did a show with Steve Zaloga, I mean, for certain places, the advances were literally using, you know, logging tracks. The images yeah. we're looking at here, they do seem to be, I mean, not massive roads, but they are, they are, they, they seem a little bit more substantial than in the Ardennes. And I'm guessing there's slightly more roads than you have in the Ardennes. There's really nothing for, in that period there. So yeah. they've got more than what they're not putting all their eggs into one basket on single roads. It seems to me there's got multiple, not, not many, but they're more than one option to get from A to B. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Was more mountainous, uh, so when you got down in the valleys, you had better developed roads than than you did in the uh, in the Ardennes. Um, but ag but again, most of them weren't paved, so you had some difficulties. Tracks, no problem, but uh, 
trucks. Yeah, there were some issues getting getting through that after they are ground churned up by the tanks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, again, same same scene a few minutes later. Uh, you see a knocked out uh, Soviet 76.2 um, millimeter anti-tank gun that was taken out by one of the leading elements. So you see this flood. You know, once they broke through the mountains and they came down into the, the lowlands, the terrain evened out a little bit more so they're able to proceed more quickly and they had room to maneuver um, whenever they ran into uh, uh, an enemy nest of resistance. And to their left, uh, north of the Viking, you had the um, Totenkopf division. And um, they had, this shows them after they made their turn to the south, approach there on the outskirts of Samor here. And again, you see the uniform this young man's wearing. Um, you know, it's the uh, old parka they introduced in 1943. Um, but again, he's pretty well equipped uh, uh, with warm clothing. And it had to be warm because, you know, you, you didn't go into a barracks at night during this battle. You slept out in the woods or you slept out in a ditch somewhere on the side of the road and uh, you couldn't light a fire. So you had to have good clothing. And, you know, from most of the photographic evidence I've seen from this period, these these two divisions are men are fairly well equipped for uh, fighting in, in, in this kind of weather. And the weather was cold, freezing, snow, sleet, rain, you name it. They encountered all of it during this operation. Then a, um, a Totenkopf, uh, uh, soft-skinned half-track towing a captured Soviet uh, 76 uh, millimeter anti-tank gun. Uh, they use these things whenever they could get them. If you could get the ammunition, very good weapon system, very good gun, high penetrating capability, uh, flat trajectory, a good, good all-around weapon. And and the Germans never had enough of their own anti-tank guns by this point. So if they captured one intact with ammo, ammo. They hitch it up and take it along with them, and they knew how to use them. A uh, little shot here shows a radio a wire, a wire laying soldier taking a break beat next to a Panzer IV uh, while one of his uh, comrades walks by with a Panzer Faust, um, you know, toted, toting a Panzer Faust on his shoulder. It's a pretty good photo. And this, these were all taken by um, an SS uh, combat photographer named uh, Grunert. Um, and his survived today mostly in the uh, um, archive in Slovenia, in Ljubljana. And, you know, they are amazing, these photos, and, and people are sort of commenting on how good they are. But And they're reminding me, in essence, of those early photos from the Ardennes when, if you didn't know any better, it, it looks like it's going very well at this point. The, these, 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 I know it's, it's a, they're, they're propaganda photos. They do suggest things are going well at this point, um, which is, I mean, I know you can draw false con- conclusions from photos, but that's, that's the impression I'm getting from them. Well, uh, reading the accounts of the... The crewmen or the or the, the guys who were taking part in this particular assault, and here they're going through the main street of Samor. Um, they they felt they were winning. Uh, you know, it's quite an exhilarating feeling to be advancing, no matter what army you're in. And and they were beginning to you know feel that momentum was beginning to build. And then they passed through this town and they fought. A, they ran into a a large number of Soviet armored vehicles and they fought quite a little quite a little tank battle uh, after they got through the town. But uh, at, at this point, they were beginning to develop momentum, and the Totenkopf didn't have quite the rough terrain that the Viking did. They had a little bit more room to maneuver, and that's important when you're uh, when you're an armored force. You need you need to be able to spread out, disperse, and deploy your your forces yeah. and take advantage of the, the inherent weapon systems of the tanks. Um, this is um, taken about the time where. Dargis, uh, Fritz Dargis, who was the commander of the uh, Panzer Regiment in the Viking Division, um, he's talking to the commander uh, of the Vikings Reconnaissance Battalion, Heinz Wagner, and uh, you know they're discussing operational matter issues. But uh, roughly about this time, he led his reduced Panzer Regiment. He only had about 50 tanks in his Panzer Regiment uh, by this point. He he was leading them in that assault to get across a highway and seize that uh, Hedgy Castle estate. And so this is taken shortly before that. So and that feeds into the next next image. Okay. Now, when they got there um, in the Hedgy Castle, and again, there's others who are um, way more um, uh, you know involved in uh, studying this than I am. So Mirko Byrell and uh, Norbert Zonweber, two historians who made this their lifetime uh, uh, focus of effort. But this particular battle uh, 
it's like the Vapen SS Battle of the Alamo. You had this tank regiment and you had the uh, uh, battalion uh, from Norga, uh, you know, Scandinavian battalion, Norwegians. There was a few Norwegians, not many, mostly I think Germans from, you know, from the Balkans. But you've got uh, their commander, who's the guy in the front with the cigar in his mouth, Fritz Vogt. He was a daredevil, kind of a wild man, drank a lot, um, pretty harsh disciplinarian. But, uh, you know, with the tank regiment and this battalion of our pseudo Norwegians, I guess there was quite a, there was a few Norwegians in there, but um, they weren't the majority. Uh, they fought like hell. They were surrounded very quickly and the Soviets threw um, a couple brigades at them and they were outnumbered by 10 or 20 to one, um, but they stood firm. Um, the Russians, or sorry, the Soviets, when they figured out they couldn't take them by assault, they sat back and shelled the hell out of the place, reduced the hedgy castle to a to ruins, and um, they still wouldn't give up. Um, they thought about disobeying orders and breaking out on their own, but uh, uh, they were told to stand fast, you're not going anywhere. And uh, the Viking was able to get some supplies to them through a, a little farm track that was uh, you know, out of the line of fire. They, they were sort of encircled, but there were still routes in and out if you know how to use the terrain. And they evacuated wounded, and so they stayed there um, till about 12 January, uh, being pounded, and uh, they knocked out a large number of, uh, of Soviet tanks and killed a, a lot of uh, Soviet infantrymen. Uh, but by the time they withdrew, they they were down to less than 20 tanks. And uh, Fritz Vogt's battalion, uh, you know, the first battalion of the Norga, um, it was had, you know had been reduced in size to a half of what it was. So it was kind of a fearic victory, but. Um, they held, they didn't surrender. Um, they were able to escape without losing anybody uh, during that. And uh, it's kind of become my, one of the myths or one of the legends of the Waffen SS that they held. And they even had a nickname for it, the Fort of the Unbreakables or the mm. their, uh, Fort des Unbeugsamen uh, in German is, is the phrase. So they're very proud of this. And you see, and this was taken while battle is still going on. They all crowded together for a, a photograph you know that uh, you, know, you see all over the place on online but most of the key commanders uh, from Dargis's uh, regiment as well as Fritz Vogt and some of his boys are all in that photo it's kind of an iconic uh, image of the whole Hungarian campaign and that's one of the Panzer IVs from the Panzer regiment outside it's a command version parked outside uh, and it was one of the few vehicles that made it out of this uh, little battle Anyway, um, let's see. So where are we here? Um, yeah. Now, due to the lack of um, flank protection, because the uh, diversionary attack in the south didn't go very far, didn't accomplish much. Um, General Balk was able to bring down the 6th Panzer Division from north of the Danube and attached attach it to Gillis Corps. And they covered the right flank of the Corps. Um, and you see here some of the men. And they'd been in action constantly now for probably almost a month. So they were beginning to show some signs of wear, but you see here they are again, they're all fairly well uh, equipped and clothed with uh, decent uh, winter clothing. And again, same same unit, 6th Panzer Division showing, having a, a very brief orders group uh, meeting beside their half tracks before they go in and to uh, carry out an attack. Now. Um, they were to play a role later when the Viking got pulled out to go around for Conrad II. Um, and they did a pretty good job there. But up until this point, they were kind of a disappointment. And that's probably because of their commander wasn't wasn't all that great. But um, at any rate, OK, so we move on. Conrad II. Now, once the uh, Conrad I culminated by 6, uh, 6 January at the latest, uh, I, I mentioned that on 8th of um, January, the 7th-11th Infantry Division took the city of uh, Gran or Ezergam very, quite unexpectedly, and they began pushing south as they were supposed to, and they didn't find a lot of resistance. So they kept pushing down that road. Uh, you'll see there in the upper right-hand corner, a small salient developing. And uh, Gila had been at, he already decided that Conrad I wasn't going to go anywhere. And he saw this as an opportunity to you know, go through an avenue of approach the Red Army wasn't expecting and relieve uh, Budapest from the northeast instead of the 
I'm sorry, from the uh, Northwest instead of the, instead of the Southwest. So they pulled out the Westline Regiment, sent it on a roundabout march up to uh, Gran and uh, joined up with the 7th 11th Infantry Division. And they pushed down this narrow valley um, past uh, uh, a couple of uh, small towns up in the mountains. And um, they got to, uh, 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 this became the main effort for, which became known as Con Conrad II. Another element of Conrad II was the South, uh, they actually did an actual, you know, instead of a feint or a, you know, a, decept a deception attack, they actually launched a, an actual offensive using 3rd Panzer Division, 4th Cav Brigade, um, you know, 1st Panzer, and they actually were able to push in and uh, take the town of Zamoli um, that you, you see there in the lower left-hand corner of the map. And um, the, the Soviets were, had to divert a couple of corps away, uh, which relieved some of the pressure on the 4th SS Panzer Corps. And, but this became a stalemate after a couple of days as well, because both, um, you know, both 1st Cavalry Corps, you see they're commanding this, and the, the two Soviet corps in question, they sort of, uh, um, you know, canceled each other out. And so the, the, the emphasis switched to the, to the north and the Viking vision game pushing down towards uh, Pilisinkaretsk. Um, within, they were only about 17 kilometers away from Budapest at this time. That was quite a controversy erupted at the time because Gila wanted, uh, you know, the German garrison in Budapest to break out because they figured, Gila had figured by this point, we can't retake Budapest and restore the old line along the, uh, the lower Danube. We can't do it. We can only, the most we can do by this point is to relieve the garrison inside of Budapest. And so that was in his mindset. But General Balk and Hitler, they both were still firm in their mind that we're going to, we're not going to evacuate Budapest. We're going to reestablish contact and we're going to restore the front line to where it was at the beginning of December, which is clearly at this point, it was impossible. They just simply didn't have the means to do so. But uh, Gillis said, to, you know, and it was known between himself, his chief of staff, his staff and his leading commanders. We ain't got enough sauce to go all the way and restore, you know, the link with Budapest. The most we can do is rescue the garrison. So that was, so he had these two diverging, divert, uh, <laughs> diverging, uh, oh boy, <laughs> we had these two different ideas of how to go yeah. about the mission. Gila wanted to rescue the garrison, whereas Hitler and Balk both wanted to, you know, put into effect this grand scheme of restoring the entire front as it was, you know, over a month earlier. And but it, it seems to me, if I'm following this correctly, Gila at least got the ability to manage Conrad II as he thought it, even if he's not getting the permission to get the, the, the troops yeah. out of Budapest. Whereas for me, a West Front guy, by 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 July, June, July, August, no commander is able to do anything without Hitler yeah. changing his mind. So at least they've got some autonomy yeah. in, in this and, area. And this is where Gila broke his broke his type. You know, Gila right. at this point had been a yet, you know, I'm a Nur Zoldat, I do what I'm told. And uh, for two days, he disobeyed direct orders, not only from General Balk, but from the Army Group uh, commander, as well as uh, Guderian, who was the executive for Hitler for you know, control of the armies on the Eastern Front. So he delayed, installed, you know, re you know, yeah, I got your order, I understand, but I'm having trouble with my radios right now. I can't really hear you very well. You know, any number of things. While, this, while he was stalling for time, he kept pushing the Westland Regiment down that down that road to Pilsenkaretz and they and they reached it by midnight on the 11th of uh, 11th of January and uh, he kept saying I'm there I, we can see Budapest from uh, where we're sitting uh, where we're standing and uh, we're gonna make it we can do it this is working and then uh, Hitler finally got wind of what was happening he says basically get him out of there I don't want this to go I have my other ideas we're gonna make another try from the south and so just as you know, they were 17 kilometers away. They thought they could see the spires of Budapest, but that's a myth. They were never close enough to see the spires. Um, they were ordered to stop, turn around, and go back to where you started from. Not only where you started from, go all the way down to Var Palata and Vesprim, 
and we're going to try this another way. So although this is probably the closest the Germans ever got to relieving Budapest, it might have worked if Gila had been supported. In this particular case, General Balk, who is known as the daredevil and the guy, you know, he's the operational genius, he, he chickened out. He, he did not, you know, display the moral, you know, the, the moral certainty or the backbone to stand up against Hitler in this particular case, even though he'd stood up against Hitler before. In this particular instance, um, Balk, he wouldn't back his commanders. And so it's kind of a, I see it as a black mark against Balk's otherwise stellar uh, career. Uh, he, you know, his loyalty to Hitler won out over his loyalty to his troops. Yeah, and it seems to me this you're you're regarding this as the tipping point in the, in the whole operation. This is the moment it 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 can't now succeed after this. Is that what you're kind of saying? Well, they they want to give one more succeed. Shot. Sorry, to succeed to the original aims. I should I should specify. Well, yes, exactly. And and by this point, uh, the fourth SS Panzer Corps they lost over thirty five hundred men, and uh, about half of their armored vehicles had been. Uh, right either broken down or were knocked out. So so then they had to drag everything back and, and then drive their tanks all the way from the northeast up near Gran, drive it all the way down to Vesprim and Bar, Bar Palata, just to the northeast of Lake Balaton for one more try, but with a little more help. So with that transition, <laughs> we'll go. Yeah, we've got now another, another flurry of photos. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, this guy, he's the chief of staff to General Bulk. He was sort of the uh, sand in the sand in the wheels, so to speak. Um, General Gedka was Balk's chief of staff, hated Gila. Uh, they'd been together in the Cherkasi pocket. Uh, Gedka couldn't stand uh, uh, Gila and the feeling was mutual. Gila accused him of trying to surrender, um, you know, conduct surrender negotiations with the Russians in the Cherkasi pocket. So um, at every opportunity, this was the guy who was always pointing out to Balk that uh, Gila failed to do that or he failed to do this or didn't send a report in time and so on. So he was constantly agitating with Balk to get Gila relieved of, of command. Didn't succeed. Okay, and this is uh, Gila talking with General Becker, um, you know, shortly before Conrad III kicked off. And again, you see the weather there. It's just terrible. Yeah. And it's Gila with his uh, aide-de-camp, uh, Gunther Lange, who's still alive, and he was a big help in uh, – when I was putting my uh, my book together, but um, he provided me a lot of a lot of uh, good insider information. Wow! Next, and this is shows troops from the West Lawn Regiment marching down that highway towards uh, Pilsenkrets. The guys you see there lying on the ground are probably from the 711th Infantry Division who, who opened the way, who uh, fought their way through the Soviet defenses so the Viking Division could rapidly move up to their objective. Um, this is this is on the road to Pilsenkrets. Do you see the, you know, broken down truck uh, and a self-propelled infantry howitzer on the right? Just to give us an idea of the weather condition, the roads were completely caked with ice, so they had a great, a very difficult time getting up and, ar and around some of the mountain passes to get uh, to their objective. It was just brutal on man and machines. Some of the troops and Viking walking along the same road. And again, you see the wet, wetter clothing. Again, here's Gila with his chief of staff. Oops, sorry. That's his chief of staff, uh, Manfred Schoenfelder on the left, who was um, stuck with him through thick and thin to the end of the war. They had a really good working relationship. Some of the guys shooting at some uh, Soviet uh, cavalrymen, you saw that in the film clip. That's from the actual still, still photographer who accompanied the uh, videographer. Okay, um, now this is the concept of operations for what became Conrad III, the final, the final attempt to uh, read Budapest, which was, um, uh, you know, the Germans had evacuated the Pest side of the fortress and they're all on the Buddha side and being pressed into an ever shrinking perimeter and being pounded constantly by General Malinowski's troops. But you'll see essentially, instead of going to the north, they're going back to the original south um, course of action, which they, called Operation Paula, but for brevity's sake or some reason, I don't know, they just called it Conrad III. So in, in addition to the 4th Panzer, fourth SS Panzer Corps, you had the 3rd Panzer Corps and about four Panzer divisions. They were going to go shoot the slot between Lake Balaton and Lake Valencia and then 
go push towards the Danube there, hit the Danube, pivot left, and follow uh, along the bank of the Danube and approach um, Budapest from the south. That was the plan. That's the plan that General Balk favored all along. Um, and so they, whatever, everything they had left uh, that was still an army group south at the time that was available. They put it into this effort. And uh, they also came, as we'll see, they came damn near uh, close to relieving Budapest with this. And it makes you wonder if they tried this first instead of the northern approach through the mountains, if they'd done this first, even though it would have taken a few days longer to assemble the forces, you know, they probably uh, had a much better chance of uh, succeeding than they did in the north. But mm. Yeah, but they, they did try it again on the 18th. So 18 days later, after Conrad one started, Conrad three kicked off, and uh, and it was very the advance was very rapid, as we'll see on the next slide there. Okay, and this is some assault guns from the 303 303rd Assault Gun Brigade, Sturmgeschütz Brigade 303 was attached to the Viking Division because by this point the Viking Division had only about 25 operational armored fighting vehicles. So they needed augmentation. And this was a uh, army troops, self uh, assault gun uh, brigade, which was attached to the Viking and provided the needed, uh, not only infantry fire support, but needed uh, anti-tank uh, capability as well. Another shot of a Panzer Force uh, L-48 of the Viking division. You know, this is one of those turretless uh, tank destroyers that began to be used more and more frequently as a substitute for tanks because they're cheap uh, to build and much you could build them much more quickly required less skilled labor yep. but not as good as a tank Hans Dorr, um now as this attack commenced he was um, you know, he was again his, his task force was leading the uh, leading the Vikings attack and on 21 January after uh, breaking through and more or less getting into the clear um, he and his staff were taken under fire by a Soviet anti-tank gun in the town of Siraj. And uh, he was critically wounded. A couple other guys were killed or wounded and uh, he was evacuated. This was his 16th wartime wound. And um, he would never recover from his injuries. He contracted an infection and died in a hospital in Germany a couple months later. But uh, when with his loss, his loss was a quite a uh, significant morale blow to the Viking division because this guy was indestructible. Um, he always bounced back from being wounded and, you know, was always the spirit of the, uh, the soul of the offense, so to speak. And when he, with him gone, they, they did, they lost something tangible that, uh, they're never quite able to replace. It seems to me, you know, when, when you've started to lose vehicles, you start to lose men, the weather has set in, you've not quite achieved the first operation or the second one or the third one. You're now losing key figures it's it's kind of too many things going wrong now it's it's all it's all going to kind of self destruct at this point yeah and uh and, and the troops except for a few days of rest after they were pulled out of conrad 2 uh, they'd been in action pretty much most of the past uh, two and a half weeks without without much of a break living in the open eating cold food when they got food sleeping in the snow uh, or the rain uh so even the toughest guys, I don't care. You take Green Berets, you know, you put them in that situation after a couple of weeks. Uh, it, it's amazing that uh, these guys were able to keep keep moving. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, the other commander, Westline Regiment, I forgot to mention him, was Franz Hack. That's him in the center. Um, and this was taken in the spring of 45 before, shortly before the armistice. But he was another old hand and, and – uh, you know, next uh, next to Hawk, he was. Uh, I'm sorry, next to Door, he was a, the next most popular and uh, skilled uh, regimental commander, and he survived the war. As um, Fritz Dargis again leading his you know, re always shrinking uh, tank regiment. Uh, by this point, he had less than 20 of his own armored vehicles, but he made good use of of what he had. And and again. Uh, Gila and Schoenfelder in his command car. Um, Gila tried to get up to the front as, as often as once a day to observe uh, observe operations. That's sounds like it's you know not very much, but when you consider that you know he tried to visit every division once a day and uh, on a mobile battlefield like what was happening here, where quite a bit of movement, uh, a lot of bypass enemy forces, um, 
he was assuming a lot of risk to get up there, but he thought it was important to see for himself with his own eyes um, what was really going on and whether his commanders, uh, you know, whether what's being reported is is the actuality and not just wishful thinking. Mm. And um, and we'll get we'll talk about this guy, but again, this is Fritz Vogt, uh, the commander of First Battalion of the Norga uh, Regiment, Third uh, Battalion Norga Regiment. Uh, again, daredevil, crazy man, uh, drank too much, swore too much, smoked too much, um, strict, harsh disciplinarian. But he was what the Germans call a draufganger, you know, a, a daredevil, a guy who would take enormous risk and somehow always seem to. Uh, always seem to succeed against whatever the odds were. He's crazy. <laughs> we, we have a, we had a few in the, uh, got a few in the American army as well. I think, I think every army has a spring thing on them at any one time. Yeah. It's, it's the way the mix, but um, yeah. So um, yeah, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. So anyway, so this is the actual Conrad three as it unfolded. And uh, you see now you got the two, two German panzer corps side by side driving. And this is the first time they've been able to attain a unified effort, you know, two corps operating in tandem with one another. And uh, they shot the gap between Lake Valence and uh, Lake uh, Balaton. Um, you had the third uh, Panzer Corps on the left and the fourth SS Corps on the right. Um, they, within two days, uh, they covered uh, uh, the, the distance all the way to the, to the Danube and uh, took a couple of towns along the Danube. Um, kicked out the Soviet uh, garrisons. Uh, a large portion of the, uh, uh, the Fourth Guards Army was cut off during this maneuver. You can see them on this map, you know, three corps retreating to the south, trying to get away from being trapped and wiped out. And it's, it led to an interesting situation where you had German units driving east and then northeast, and you had the Soviet units trying to get away to the south. And frequently their, their lines, uh, their col columns ran into one another, and there would be these sharp, sharp uh, little engagements where, you know, the tanks would stop and start shooting at these trucks carrying uh, soldiers being withdrawn. So it was quite a, you know, quite a free for all there for a couple of days until the Soviet units were able to finally withdraw safely and they established a new front to the south and they were able, to, they came back later on. But as you see, um, the spearheads were the third and the fifth SS Panzer Division. They started making their turn to the north uh, headed towards um, headed towards uh, Budapest, which again was ever shrinking little uh, little perimeter. On the 22nd, um, the first Panzer Division took the the, the city of Stuhl Weissenberg or Zika's Zika's Fervahar, and uh, that was an important move because that's a key nodal point. If you look at all the roads, there's railroads also connecting that, and by controlling that city, it safeguarded the supply lines for both both panzer corps because quite a bit of the supplies had to pass through there to get to uh, the front so you, you see it's developing here um there was also efforts up up the north by uh the hungarians began pushing into the veritas mountains and pushing the the soviets back so you see something begin to form that looks like a pocket uh, especially between the Gorexa Mountains and the German forces in, in the south near Lake Valence. But again, Gila was focused. Budapest, that's where I'm going. That's that's where I'm that's where I'm driving. Next slide. However, <laughs> next slide, please. Yeah, it's the next I've moved on. Is that now? I did move on. Oh, I think. okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, that one, then there's that one. Oh, I, I didn't I didn't advance mine. Okay, so anyway, um, General Balk makes a, makes a big mistake uh, at this point. Uh, he sees a possible pocket forming where he can trap uh, four corps, three or four corps of the Fourth Guards Army. And so instead of continuing the mission, he orders Gila to do a 90 degree turn to the left or to the north rather and push his troops north and cut off this um, this large pocket, what he assumes is a large pocket of, pocket of Soviet troops. And that robs the attack of momentum. And this is something that uh, that took place, I believe, uh, yeah, hold on, let me consult my notes here real quick. Yeah, on the uh, 24th of January, he orders Giller to do a left turn and uh, with three panzer divisions abreast, they start heading northwest towards uh, uh, Verdes Bogler, I think, is the that town up there. 
And uh, about the same time, this is when the Fourth Guards Army uh, gets a couple more uh, mechanized corps and a tank corps to uh, counterattack. And this I'm guessing where, at this point, Doug, you know, just to give you a, a break now, this is, you know, as we've had comments on the sidebar, the, the German forces that, you know, the supplies are depleted, they can't bring up spare. People are saying vehicles are being held together with kind of sealing wax and string. And they, they, at the same point, the Red Army now, I guess, although they were outnumbered probably at the beginning, they're now bringing everything up. They're bringing their, their superior um, back up to play now. So it's the, yeah. the, the balance has shifted, I'm guessing. Oh, yes. Uh, and the big the turning point is 26 January. Uh, that's where you, uh, you know, that's as, as far as they get. And um, on the 27th of January, uh, the big Soviet counterattack begins where they throw uh, three mech mechanized corps, a rifle corps and a tank corps against that little salient you see that is formed there. And uh, by this point, the Germans have only 50 operational tanks and assault guns. 50 and the Soviets are throwing in excess of 200 um, tanks and assault guns in their direction. And so what you see is a huge armor battle take place where the Germans are outnumbered four to one. And, um, and uh, the, the, the one that Soviet one, uh, the 23rd tank corps thrown in the battle directly from the line of March, no opportunity to do a reconnaissance no opportunity to see the lay of the land or even know what the enemy's situation is. So they're flung into battle um, directly into the teeth of these German units that are still trying to advance and cut off the, the Russians or the Soviet troops in the pocket. Big battle uh, evolves that day. Um, 122 uh, Soviet tanks are knocked out in that day alone, which is an enormous number of, of tanks. And the Germans don't get away either without a scratch. They take some lumps as well. Um, but one of the uh, the key points, and I talked about uh, vote Fritz vote a little while ago. There's a village called Petend, uh, which is sort of at the base of the salient. If you look on the map there, where you have First Panzer Division and Third SS Division, there's a little town called Petend. You could barely make it out because of the graphic, but um, that's where the the Soviet uh, main effort is focused on taking Petten because if they take that town, they're going to cut off the bulk of two German Panzer divisions that are. Uh, making this attack and uh, vote the crazy wild man with his reduced battalion. Uh, they hold out. Uh, they're, they're augmented by a tiger tank and a couple other Panthers, but a few anti-tank guns, not much. They're outnumbered 20 to one. And it's another repeat of the, you know, of the hedgy castle battle where it's another little Alamo yeah. where they basically fight um, the Russian, the Soviet attack to the death. And uh, this guy vote knocks out five tanks with Panzerfaust himself. Um, shows you what a crazy guy he is. But uh, they hold, and um, the Soviet attack breaks up, and um, and they buy time to enable the rest of the guys to escape. And you know, Gillard called it off. He said, "Nah, we're, we're, we got to get out of here. We're about to get whomped." And uh, and that's a tactical term, getting whomped. By the way, I just want to let mm. you know. And I say you 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 don't yeah. win battles. By no. doing valiant last stands, you know, like valiant last stands sell kind of sell propaganda magazines, and you can make comic books out of them. Yeah. But they don't, they don't usually win you battles. It's it's, no. it's, it's desperate times, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, but in this particular case, um, it it was made sense that he had to do that because he was able to hold the gap open long enough for First Panzer Division and Third SS Division to escape. So, if he hadn't, and his he essentially sacrificed his battalion, like you said, they right, yeah reduced to less than a company size unit, but they began pulling back. Um, and it's ironic because at one point, uh, the first Panzer Division had crossed the uh, the Valley, the Valley Viz or the Valley River and uh, was talking on the radio with uh, the garrison inside Budapest and say, hey, you guys, we're coming to get you, just stand fast. But just when they were about to, and Gila knew about this, but he didn't say anything um, because he had orders to, do this pointless uh, envelopment attack. Um, but then um, General Balk found out that uh, Gila had ordered this unauthorized uh, maneuver. So Gila had to turn around and order first Panzer Division to turn around and, and cross the river and come back. And then they began, then began the withdrawal because what we'll see what happened next is the uh, Red Army began a series of large scale um, uh, counterattacks to compress the German salient. And the Germans by this point, they're exhausted. They, like I mentioned, they had fewer than 50 
operational tanks out of 306 they had on hand when they started. Uh, so you know, the longer they stayed there, the greater their odds were they were going to get trapped and wiped out. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you know, we are coming towards the, the end now with the with the, the the victory for the Red Army at this at least in this battle. So I'll, I'll let you hand over, and then we've got a couple of we have some questions at the end. But okay. Yeah, and again, this is a photo of, um, of Soviet troops marching through downtown Budapest. Um, next slide. And that's, again, uh, and I'll talk about what happened in, in Budapest. So um, with the, the relief effort having completely culminated, come to a grinding halt by 28 January, that was the last possible opportunity they, they had to relieve Budapest. Um, yeah, there's at least two occasions uh, that the commander of the encircled forces in Budapest had had to do a breakout on his own and, and actually link up with an approaching relief force. But both occasions, he did not rise to that, just like Von Paulus did. Von Paulus never mm. seriously compl- uh, you know, thought about doing a, uh, an attack to, to meet the relief force. And Pfeffer Wildenbrook didn't do it either. I mean, he wasn't a bad commander, it's just that he, you know, followed orders. However, um, he authorized a breakout um, on the night of 11 February with no preparation whatsoever. And um, about 30,000 troops of the encircled uh, uh, garrison in Budapest made a, a breakout. Some went west where they ran into the uh, Soviet encircling ring and were chopped to bits. Um, but most of the survivors went northwest or, or north and met up with uh, you know, some of the forces that had been basically sitting in a static position between uh, Mani and uh, Pilisent uh, Lelek uh, for the past uh, couple of weeks. And out of the 30,000 or so men who attempted to break out, between six and 700, depending whose figures you believe, actually physically made it out. Uh, so it was a horrendous humanitarian catastrophe, not only for the Soldiers trapped in Budapest and, and tried to break out, but for the civilian population as well. I think the estimated number of civilians who died in Budapest was in excess of 100,000. Wow. Yeah, next. Next slide. That, and these, uh, this is from a, a motion picture uh, that was shown in the uh, Deutsche Volkenschau. We've got that film clip, uh, but this shows some of the few survivors. They're so exhausted, uh, they had to pick them up in a half track and, and carry them. Um, back to the reception area where they could get some hot food and, you know, medical attention. And and stuck all in the middle of this, just like what's happening in most wars, like the one going on right now, is the civilian population. Uh, the Hungarian population weren't crazy about being under German rule, um, but they were less, even less enthusiastic about living under uh, under Soviet rule. And uh, most of them had no idea or had not been informed about what was coming. And mm-hmm. so uh, they were completely surprised and overwhelmed when the Red Army occupied, uh, you know, uh, any, any any piece of hung- Hungary that they that they had conquered. So um, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy, uh, you know, not only for them, um, but for, you know, all of Europe, too, I, I guess you could say. Yeah, 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 Next. Yeah. yeah. And there's a picture of some SS guys probably from the Totenkopf talking to a woman um, during Conrad three, uh, trying to find out, you know, you seen any Russians lately or, or, or whether she needed food or something. And I guess we'll do the video, the final film now, then we've got the, the map of what happened next. So should we do right. the film that shows the, 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 the aftermath? Yes. Yeah. And this, this shows the same half track we just saw in the still photo of these, survivors are just exhausted after two or three days of just walking and not, not resting, you know, just constantly moving just to escape. And, and, uh, you know, without eating it, Lufafa dropped rations uh, on them. Uh, sometimes they actually got to, got to the target, but most of the time the rations fell in the hands of the Russians. But for these six or 700 guys, they were given a few days rest um, and then sent right back in <laughs> shortly afterwards. So, and you know, there was no end to it until um, May 8th, 1945. Well, that brings that to an end, and it will just put the map back in. So, um, 
we, we just need to sort of sum up, although we can have you back on and talk about the next stage in a future show, because your 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 book, your series of books, I should mention, folks, the links yeah. to Douglas's books are in the description below. There's a set of books about this, about yeah. the, the fourth core. But, um, yeah, because one of the questions we had earlier, Doug, is, is how... You know, you've just thought about how smashed the Germans are. You know, not many get out. They've been they're worn out. Are the Red Army able to immediately pick up on the offensive, or do they have to 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 kind of have some time to rebuild as well? Um, you know, from from my uh, from my research, they didn't pause because up until twenty eight or twenty seven, twenty eight January, they were defending and giving giving ground. Um, so the more the more they fell back, the more they, you know, their supply lines were shorter and, uh, you know, they were getting better supply the further back they went. So when the order came uh, to counterattack that by this point, the German lines were so overextended and they'd suffered so many casualties and lost so many uh, of tanks and other heavy weapons that, you know, the Russians would advance and push, but they didn't have, there was very few instances at first where they had to, really to go into all out attacks. The Germans were sort of gradually withdrawing, fighting, delaying actions until um, they established a new defense line that stretched between Lake Balaton and uh, Lake Valence. Um, so the, the Soviet, uh, you know, the Red Army, they didn't really pause too much. They just kept going. And, and that's just the way it was, even though the, the, the Soviet units were down to you know, half strength themselves and they suffered some awful losses as well. But they could get they could get more tanks. They could get more men. Uh, they could get arms and food and ammunition. Whereas the Germans, uh, by this point, uh, everything was becoming scarcer, especially especially fuel for their vehicles. And that was uh, only going to get worse as time went by. Now, the attack you just saw, this Conrad III, this attack shooting the gap between Lake Balaton and Lake Valence, this was almost the exact same game plan the Germans were, were going to follow in March when they started um, Operation Spring Awakening, the last German offensive on the Eastern Front that kicked off 5 March 1945. But um, except for the lines you see here, uh, pretty much everything else had remained in, in place uh, except the German defense line stretched between the two lakes you see there. And that's pretty much a starting point for Operation Frühling Erwachen, which is spring awakening now uh, as far as losses this was a pretty bloody little campaign um the germans uh, you know they lost approximately twenty thousand, almost twenty one thousand men killed wounded and missing not counting the garrison in budapest which out of eighty thousand men roughly uh, almost you know except for a couple thousand including some flown out some of the wounded uh, they lost the entire garrison. So if you throw in the casualties from Budapest, German losses almost amounted to 100,000 men. Um, the Germans lost about, and Hungarians lost about 202,000, uh, I'm sorry, 202 armored fighting vehicles, tanks, assault guns, tank destroyers. Um, and by uh, 31 January, they only had 184 operational uh, armored fighting vehicles, uh, period, uh, out of 590 on hand. The others were broken. Um, broke down waiting parts whatever so uh the soviets on the other hand uh, uh they lost anywhere depending on who you believe between uh 50,000 and uh, 85,000 uh troops and 570 tanks 234 assault guns so 804 tanks destroyed so even though the germans had a kill ratio of about 4 to 1 it didn't matter because when this was over uh, the red army as far as tanks had more tanks uh, at the end and they had when they started. And um, and that sort of sets the stage for um, Fruley Never Oxen and a month and a half later. Indeed, and we'll, we'll make uh, the Woody Lee's the last question and it could be a potential long one, but kind of do a, do a, do a reasonably swift answer response to it. And it is in hindsight, what would have been their best opportunity for, for a breakout breakthrough to Budapest? Well, obviously, you know, you, 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 you suggested earlier the Southern route seems yeah. to have been the more favorable one, but was there an alternative option at all of just kind of maintaining a, a defensive uh, position rather than doing an offensive? Or do you think doing something offensive was the right, the right call, just not quite what they did? Well, I, I think, um, well, the, the other, the other, purpose of this not only was to relieve uh, 
Budapest, but to shore up the front and reestablish the front along the uh, Danube River. Um, the reason why Hitler wanted to do that was to pre protect the oil fields that were at the southwest corner of Lake Balaton at Najikanitsa. Um, they had to be held, and he thought this was the best way to go about it. Um, if they had written off the Budapest garrison originally and said, sorry, guys, um, nice to know you, um, the Germans probably could have held out in Hungary the, along the lines we saw when we started. They probably got held out to, until the end of the war. Um, because at this point, Stalin didn't want to incur any more casualties than he had to, because by January, February 1945, he was thinking about post-war. He was thinking about, well, I may have to take on the Western allies, so I mm. want to spare, you know, husband my resources as much as possible, which was in direct opposition to his attitude at the beginning of the war. But by this point, he, he did not want to incur too many casualties. But in this particular instance, because of the German offensives, um, they wound up losing a lot of men anyway. Uh, but at least uh, the Red Army could could replenish its losses a lot easier than the Germans could. Mm. I mean, we have various people who said, "What, what would they have done if they got to Budapest anyway?" I mean, the, the, you know, it's, it's, yeah, this, this is these, you know, with the, we know with the Ardennes and the Antwerp thing that, that, that there's the short term goal maybe is reasonable, but what are you going to do with it long term? I mean, just that stabilize a front there, I guess. Yeah, my, my opinion, they, they never had enough forces to relieve Budapest and restore the line along the, uh, along the Danube River. That was n never possible, and. Um, even if they got into Budapest, that just would have meant that they would have augmented the size of the encircled mm -hmm. garrison because, you know, all of it took everything they had just to get 17 kilometers away from Budapest. And uh, because the, the garrison was never, the, the commander never intended to carry out a, a meeting attack to link up with the relief force. There was, in my opinion, they could have, they could have done one of two things. They could have abandoned Budapest and written it off entirely, or they could have ordered a breakout. If they could order the breakout early, like the first week of January, um, most of the garrison probably would have been able to fight their way out. But by by this time, by Conrad III, even though the first Panzer Division was in radio, you know, contact with the garrison, Pfeffer Wildenbrook didn't have the uh, moral of uh, you know moral fiber to order to disobey Hitler and in order a breakout. It wasn't and it breakout. does all come down to Hitler. At this point, Hitler only has to have two reactions. It's either hold the last man, man or counterattack. That's his two kind of binary uh, decisions. I yeah. mean, we, go, we, we don't want to start a whole conversation about Hitler's uh, lack of tactical um, uh, ability by this point in the war, but I think we shall bring things to a halt, really. It's been a fantastic... We said we, we, we did longer than we said we would, but it's been in, incredibly popular. People have enjoyed it a lot, so um, it's been really good talking to you. Before I say goodbye... I'm just going to remind you what we got coming up. So, folks, nothing tomorrow. And then Wednesday, we have two shows. So, Wednesday, David Stahl is beaming in from Australia. So, that'll be 11 a.m. UK time, talking about the retreat from Moscow. And then in the evening, a first time guest to World War II TV, Ben Claremont, is talking about Red Army deep battle and deep operations. Then, Thursday, we have talking about uh, the Red Army storming into Europe and the three, third and fourth Ukrainian fronts. Then Susan Grunewald is joining us, talking about German POWs who are taken back to the Soviet Union. And then finally on Saturday, we have a wonderful show about the resistance in Poland, 1939 to 1944. So that's, that will conclude yeah. Eastern Front Week. But right now, I'll bring Ian, uh, Doug back in just to say thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you. Good. Yeah, so, and I just want to give a shout out to my uh, proofreader, Seaburn. So, but anyway, brilliant. it's been fun. Um, enjoyed. Uh, there's a lot more, obviously, that went on that we could talk about for hours. Uh, but you know, all I can say is, if if you want to learn a little bit more, you know, you can go pick up a copy of this. Yeah, hold hold it up there. It's always good. We don't mind people plugging their books. Brilliant. And yeah, as I said, folks, the link to the books in the description below. So, Doug, thank you very much. I will let you get back to your afternoon. It's been thank wonderful you. talking to you. This is Paul Woodard from World War Two TV saying I will see you all again for our double bill on Wednesday. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.